really encourage you to invite somebody. Ask somebody from your neighborhood or your family, somebody from school or work to come and join us on Christmas Eve and then come and join and let us usher in uh, the Lord's coming through worship on Sunday morning. Uh, It'll be uh, a simple Sunday morning. We will not have any childcare and we will also not have coffee and tea and hot chocolate. Fill that up at home before you come and join us, but just come and let us give worship and praise to our God on that day. Uh, We also um, have Uh, We also are beginning our officer nomination process. So this is not the typical time of year we might do this, but in light of uh, events and transitions and different things going on, uh, we want to, uh, we are going to begin the training of new uh, elders, deacons, and deaconesses. And so that nomination process is now open in your new city news this week in that email. There's two different links that you need to go in there and you need to click on. Uh, and what those two links are is one is the officer description notebook of what the role and what that looks like. And there's great notes and great information in that. Uh, there's also a link that you can click on to nominate someone. And so without, with those nominations, we need four different family units to nominate somebody. And then from there, what we do is we, inv- we are inviting them into a training process. And that training process will begin in January. And then once that uh, training process of about 13 or 14 weeks is completed, then there will be, uh, we'll have a, a, a elections by you as a congregation and then hopefully By June, uh, we will have ordination and installation and commissioning uh, for those officers. So this will take place over the next several months, but we really need you to strongly begin to pray and consider who you might nominate first and foremost for elder. And so in that notebook, just three quick descriptions as you think this morning about what the qualifications for an elder might be. So there are three things uh, that we'd like to highlight. One is that an elder's role is the governing and leading of the church. The second one, as you see people who are providing pastoral care of the flock. And the third one is those who are providing preaching and teaching and doctrinal instruction. So if you look and you see in our congregation men who would fit that description, then we encourage you to begin to nominate them. And and what you're nominating them for is to enter into that training process and to see where the Lord might lead in that. So we invite you to participate in that. And then we have deacons who are men that we ordain and install, and we have deaconesses who are women that we commission in to serve in this way. And their role is mercy within the church and in the community. It's a stewardship of finances and a care of church facilities and other resources. So it's a a serving office. So if you see people who you would say fit that description, we encourage you to nominate them and, and, and as they begin to enter into that training process and discerning what the Lord's call may be for that. And so what we do with those nominations is the elders in session will gather together and uh, as, they, um, as they approve of those nominations, then we begin to invite people into that process. So this process is open for nominations from now until December 18th. So we really want to encourage every member of our church to fill out one of those nominations forms. Uh, that, like I said, that can be found in a link in our New City News. It's also in a link in our Church Center app. So we encourage you to open those and check those out uh, today and begin to prayerfully consider who God might call you or who God might be leading you uh, to nominate in that. This morning, we also uh, have opportunity, if you flip to the very back of your bulletin, uh, we, you may notice that perhaps there are a little bit different information there. On the back of your bulletin is listed a little bit of some staff change that we've had. So first and foremost, uh, we want to thank Amanda Heverly for the last year and a half and all of the service she has done uh, for uh, our student ministry administration and in our events coordinator. And she's having a baby shortly after the first of the year. So she's reached a point where she needs to Uh, stop in that role, but we are making a few changes. We're adding four specific people. Uh, We are, Jen Scone is coming on as our student ministry admin. Uh, All these people are starting this week. Uh, Michelle Lukenville is coming on as our events coordinator. 
And then we have the privilege of also welcoming Cam and Remy Dickinson, who are going to help out in a part-time capacity and come alongside us in student ministry uh, in an interim role to help us through this transition over the course of the next six to nine months and whatever that timeline might look like. So if you see them, welcome them, encourage them this morning. Uh, I am personally incredibly thankful and excited to have all of them join us, and so please welcome them today. I'd also like to thank all of you who joined us at our house this week for our open houses. It was a joy to be with you and sit with you and laugh and tell stories and get to know all of you more. So for all who are able to join us this week, we are so thankful that you were able to come and uh, we look forward to connecting with all of you more and more as the coming months and years uh, go forward. This morning as we worship, as we worship each week, we take a moment and we present to God his tithes and our offerings. Uh, it is an opportunity for us to give praise and thanks to God for all he has provided for us. He has provided for us in such a way that we have lost track of where our needs stopped and our wants began. So in praise and thanks to God, we give his tithes and our offerings. There are two ways in which you can give. There is a black box over here to my right, and there's also a black box behind you to give of a physical gift, or you can do online options as well. There's a QR code in your bulletin for those. Now this morning, let us stand and give praise to our God and respond with a doxology. Faith, Ooh. let's profess our faith together from the Word of God. Please do so as indicated by the bulletin on page four. I will start us off. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, being born in the likeness of men. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Praise God for that. You may take your seat. Um, children, of families with children in preschool age are now um, can now take their children to kids' Bible time. Uh, we are happy if kids stay in the service with us as well. Um, and I would like to invite Elder Mark Krieg to offer us a prayer of, a pastoral prayer and prayer of illumination. Good morning, New City. Uh, my name is Mark Krieg, and I am also one of the elders here, and just want to remind you that after the service, I'll be up front, and every week an elder will be up front and available to talk to or pray to if you, if you uh, so desire. With that said, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we love you. We look at what you have revealed of yourself in Scripture and our hearts rejoice. Our hearts are drawn to you. We love you because you are kind, because you are good, you are merciful. We love you because you are slow to anger and your love is sure. We love you because you are the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. We love you because you have first loved us. Thank you for being a God who is truly worthy of our deepest loyalty, our highest affection. Yet, Lord, we confess that we have not always loved you as we should. Too often we love ourselves far more. We choose to do what pleases us rather than what pleases you. We have chosen to pursue our heart's desires instead of yours. We confess our sin, our sinfulness, the sins we have committed, and our very tendency towards sin. Forgive us, Lord, for being sinners. And do forgive us for each and every transgression of your law and each and every failure. Thank you, Lord, that you do forgive. Thank you that you have forgiven. Thank you that you will always forgive. Thank you that your heart is forever inclined towards forgiveness, that your love is deep, strong, and true. Thank you that your love does not waver and does not wither. Thank you that you have restored the relationship that we ruined, that you have bound up all that we had broken. Thank you that you have encouraged us to come to you, and thank you that you tell us to come as we are. Thank you that you receive us with arms wide open, that you make us new. And Father, you have now invited us to bring our prayers before you, to speak so you can listen and respond. And so because you told us to do this, we now bring our petitions. We ask that we would be faithful, faithful to be what you, who you tell us to be, faithful to value what you tell us to value, and faithful to do what you have told us to do. Oh Lord, we praise you for the birth of Elizabeth Clay Lukenbill. We pray for her parents. We pray for rest for our mothers and our fathers. We pray for the health, strength, and rest for our pregnant mothers. We pray for Pastor Matt Lukenbill and his family. We pray for our staff, our leaders, our deacons, our pastoral search committee, and for our elders. We praise you for, our, for answered prayer requests. We ask for healing for those with ongoing physical pain. We pray for comfort and peace for those struggling with depression or anxiety. We pray for those who are lonely or grieving the loss of a loved one during the Christmas season. We pray for hurting families. We pray for our lost community our state and our country. We pray for the renewal of Metro Detroit. Lord, would you make New City a place that stays rooted in your scripture and continues to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray New City would be a place that promotes, protects, and values all human life. Lord, would you use New City Presbyterian Church to change our hearts so we love our spouses, our children, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our classmates, and our coworkers. We ask that you would be the center of our relationships. We ask that we would live with kindness, gratitude, patience, and generosity towards each other. We ask that we would comfort one another in sorrow. We ask that we would forgive one another when sinned against, that we would be slow to speak, and quick to point out any and every evidence of your grace. We pray that we would live well in this world as faithful neighbors, faithful employees, faithful students, and faithful friends. Help us to live in a way that displays the gospel. Help us to be quick to tell others about Jesus. Help us to carry out your work in this world to serve as your representatives. And finally, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would keep us faithful that you would preserve us until the day we see you. Please, Lord, continue to show us your love. Please, Lord, continue to help us to love you as we've been so perfectly and wonderfully loved. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand for the reading of God's word. 
the proclamation of God's word from Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You may be seated. Okay. Well, have you ever been asked to do something big? Something maybe a little bit too big that seemed impossible maybe at first blush, but because of the person that you, who was asking you to do this big, maybe even impossible thing, you loved them, you respected them, you thought, well, I'll give this a try. Um, <clears throat> kids, you probably have experienced this with your parents. Uh, you may not remember being a toddler, but I'm sure there were many times where your mom or your dad sat down in the living room a couple feet away from you, and they extended their arms out to you, and they said, come. And as a toddler who really could not walk, all you could do was couch surf, you decided to give it a try anyway. And I'm sure there were many attempts where you mostly fell but were caught until you finally got the walking thing down. Uh, maybe you remember a parent teaching you how to ride your bike. Um, man, it sure looked easy when other people rode their bike, but when you got on, it was all wobbles. Um, it seemed impossible. Uh, you probably crashed a number of times, but, be, but that parent kept assuring you, you can do this. Just keep trying. You've got this. Um, or how about this one? When I was 15 years old, my parents uh, were teaching me to drive, and they had a manual transmission car, a Geo Prism, and uh, they wanted me to learn how to do uh, the stick shift. And so my mom took me out to the high school parking lot, and um, she, she figured, hey, the, uh, no traffic, right? So let's get down this whole like clutch timing thing with the stick shift, um, the whole feel of it first before we get out onto the road. And um, man, for the life of me, I could not figure out this whole clutch thing. And I was stalling this car out time after time after time. And uh, my mom, bless her heart, she could not figure out how to stall because she was so good at this. And she's trying to understand what's going wrong. And we ended up very, very frustrated. Um, so she taps out and she has my dad, you know, take a turn at this. And uh, we're still at the high school parking lot. And you know, I'm still in the same situation and I can't figure this thing out. And my dad says to me, and my dad is very laid back. He is not like a hard driving person at all. Uh, he says to me, take it out on the road. And I'm freaking out. What are you talking about? That's impossible. Take it out onto the road. But you know what? We took it out onto the road and I pretty quickly figured out how to do that clutch, stick shift, timing thing because of all the pressure of all the cars around me. So dad was right. Good job, dad. Um, man, God does the same thing with us, right? He calls us to big things that sometimes feel impossible, and he wants us to trust him uh, rather than trust our own selves. And we see this exact dynamic at play in the scripture passage that we uh, heard this morning. And, and in that passage, we see that nothing is impossible for God. His word will never fail, and so therefore, we can trust him at his word. Um, we're going to see three things that kind of stand out from this text. The first is that the God of the impossible speaks. The second is that the God of the impossible sends. And the third is that God's word will never fail. <clears throat> so first, 
we see that the God of the impossible speaks. We see here in Luke 1 that God is ending 400 years of prophetic silence, which Javier uh, said last week uh, very well. From Malachi to Matthew, 400 years without a true prophetic word from God. God's people throughout their history in good times and in bad had grown accustomed to having God's prophets declaring to them God's word. Samuel, Nathan, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and on and on. Prophecy, for prophecy to cease for 400 years was striking. It was disorienting. It was haunting. The people of God must have wondered, where is God? Why is he so silent? And we can relate to that feeling. We know what it's like to wait through a silent period. As New City Church, we are in a period of waiting. We're waiting for a new senior pastor, six months and counting. Individually, in our own lives, there's no doubt that there's some of us right now who feel like we're in a long and endless waiting period. We're waiting for God to show up. It's been weeks, it's been months, it's been years, and we need him to speak. We need him to act. As the worldwide body of Christ, we are in a period of waiting. From the first advent of Jesus 2,000 years ago to his second advent, 2,000 years and counting. We know what it's like to wait through silent periods with God. But let me offer you two comforts in the silent period. First, God still speaks in the silent periods. He speaks by his Holy Spirit, and he speaks especially by his word. Even in those long seasons when you feel like God isn't speaking to you, or even listening, he is still speaking by his word. Just as the people of God for 400 years, from Malachi to Matthew, could read the word of God and hear God speaking to them, even if faintly, so too we can hear God speak to us today through reading his word, through prayer, through the leading of the Holy Spirit within us. He who promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you, but rather that he will be with you always to the end of the age, he will never cease to speak to you by his word. Second, God's silent periods will not last forever. The silent periods will come to an end, and that's exactly what we see here in Luke 1. In God's perfect timing, the silent periods of our lives come to an end. That's perspective that produces hope in our hearts. Psalm 30, verses 4 and 5 say, Sing praise to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. His anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Here in Luke 1, we see the end of a significant silent period. God is once again speaking to his people through his angel Gabriel, and he has a double announcement. So the first thing that we see is that the God of the impossible speaks. The second thing we see is that the God of the impossible sends. God sends a herald, the angel Gabriel. Whereas before we're told that Zechariah saw an unnamed angel of the Lord in verse 11, and then that angel is identified or identifies himself as Gabriel in verse 19. Here in our passage today, we're told right away that it's Gabriel who is sent to Mary. His first announcement was last week to Zechariah and to Elizabeth. He was announcing the forerunner, forerunner, John the Baptist. Here we have Gabriel's second announcement. God is sending his son, Jesus. Gabriel tells Mary many wonderful things about this surprise baby. His name will be Jesus in verse 31. In verse 32, he will be great. He will be the son of the Most High, He will be heir to the throne of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, in verse 33, and of his kingdom there will be no end. In verse 35, he will be called Holy and the Son of God. If you know nothing about the Bible, if today happened to be the first time you even heard of Jesus, I think it would still be plain to see that this baby Jesus is very special. But if we listen to this announcement from Gabriel with Jewish ears from the first century, we begin to hear and to see and to understand just how deeply significant this announcement is and how deeply significant the baby is that's being announced. This baby will be named Jesus. Jesus is a common Hebrew name 
which we've heard of, which we have, called Joshua. And it means Yahweh saves, or God saves. It comes from an Old Testament figure and prophet, Joshua, who led the people of God out of their exodus wanderings and into the conquest of the promised land. Turns out Gabriel makes one other visit. In Matthew 1.21, he visits Joseph, and he explains that this child will be named Jesus, just as he does here to Mary. And he explains that he's named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So, this Joshua, this Jesus, will lead his people out of a far more deadly peril, which is that of their own sins, and into an eternal kingdom from which they can never be exiled. This baby will be great, the Son of the Most High. This is echoes of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, which say, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. This baby will be the heir to the throne of David. Echoes of Psalm 132, verses 11 to 12, which say, The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. This baby will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Echoes of Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with clouds of heaven there came one, one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. This baby, his kingdom, it will have no end. Echoes of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. This baby will be called holy. Echoes of Psalm 1610, which Acts 2, 25 through 32 quotes and attributes to Jesus and says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. This baby will be called the Son of God. Echoes of Psalm 2, 7 and 8, which says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. See, if we listen to Gabriel's announcement with Jewish ears from the first century, alarm bells are going off everywhere. It's happening. He's here. He's finally here, the one that God has been promising all this time, the Messiah, the son of David, the one who rescues us from our sin and frees us from our oppressors, who will turn the upside down things right side up, the anointed one who will establish the rule and the reign of God. He's coming. He's coming now. What kind of baby is this? Well, it's precisely the baby that we need. Our Heavenly Father, who created us and loves us dearly, has become the object of our scorn and rebellion. We constantly choose our own way rather than God's way. Apart from Him, our hearts are sick with sin. And that's exactly why He's sen sending His baby Son to save us from our sins. If we would simply acknowledge what's true, that we are sinners alienated from God and in need of His restorative work, seeking His forgiveness and reconciliation, Placing our full faith and confidence in him, he will rescue us from our justly deserved condemnation and welcome us into his family. 
This is the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you feel your heart inclined towards Jesus today, if you're ready to turn to him for the first time, cry out to God and receive his son as your Lord and your Savior. This baby is also precisely the baby that God has promised to send, which we've just seen, all of which serves to prove another point, which is that God's word will never fail. And that's the third thing that we see. God's word will never fail. Now let's take a minute to consider, consider Mary, who's also at the center of this story that we've read. <clears throat> Here's some things that are true about Mary. Scholars believe that Mary, at this time in this story, is about 12 to 14 years old. Middle schoolers and high schoolers among us, if you have been tuned out until now, now's the time to tune back in. Mary is a very young teenager. She's 12 to 14 years old. She's betrothed or engaged to Joseph, who is in all likelihood between 16 and 19 years old. There's some debate about that, but that's the way I lean on this one. Um, and so you see that God is writing a teenage love drama into the very center of the most important story of all of history. The baby Jesus is going to be born to some teenage parents, which is incredible. Mary is also a virgin. Um, now, I have to say, from time to time, it becomes fashionable to call into question whether Mary really was a virgin or whether it's necessary to believe in the virgin birth because, after all, maybe virgin just means young woman or unmarried, like our English word maiden does. <clears throat> but I think the text is very clearly presenting Mary as a virgin, not just a young, not just unmarried, but clearly as a virgin, and we'll see more on that in a minute. Mary is also from Nazareth. Nazareth is not on the maps. Nazareth is a village existing in obscurity, which means Mary probably would have expected to live a life of, of, of obscurity. <clears throat> she probably had no expectation of being a public figure or an influencer. She had no expectation of making a headline or a history book. She probably just had an expectation of living an ordinary, humble life in an obscure village in the ancient Near East. You could say that in the eyes of the world, Mary is a nobody from nowhere. And it's to this girl that God sends one of his chief angels and says, you are the one I want. I choose you. Mary, you get the joy and the honor of being the mother to the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Mary, I choose you. Here's an application for you and for me. God chooses nobodies from nowhere to play major roles in accomplishing his plans and purposes for all of redemptive history. See, you don't have to be from a big city. You don't have to have a big TikTok or Instagram following. You don't have to have a great educational background or a great professional resume or professional network. You don't even have to be in your 20s. God can use you. If your heart is wholly given to God, he can use you and he will use you. Now, Mary has a question. This is all wonderful news. It's overwhelming news. But she has a question, and that's understandable. Verse 34, she asks, how will this be since I'm a virgin? The Greek here uh, says, how will this be since I do not know a man? Literally. So first, this is where it's clear that virgin means virgin. Mary has faithfully followed what God has commanded. She's kept herself sexually pure until marriage so that she can honor God and give her whole self to her husband. The second thing is, Mary's question is a clear juxtaposition with Zechariah, who we heard about last week, who also had a question, and a couple things to note. Uh, the, the actual wording of Zechariah's question and Mary's question here are really not that different. The key difference is not in the words of the questions that they ask. Rather, the key difference is the heart posture of their question asking. Remember uh, from last week that we saw that Zechariah was called righteous and blameless along with his wife Elizabeth, and yet he doubts God's word to him spoken through Gabriel. Now, here's the thing that I love about the scripture. 
it's not just um, a collection of stories that are made up. Um, and so it doesn't just have simple, flat, two-dimensional characters as a storybook might have, where some are good and others are bad. Rather, the scripture is an accurate ret retelling of history, of real history, of real people who are complex. And that's why it can be true at the same time that Zechariah is both righteous and yet doubting. Mary, although the text doesn't explicitly call her righteous and blameless, like it does for Zechariah, nevertheless, she also seems to be righteous and blameless. Uh, she's called the favored one in verse 28. And in verse 30, she's found favor with God. She has kept herself a virgin, like we just pointed out. And Mary asks, asks her question in verse 34 from a believing heart, from a trusting heart which we see in her response in 38, which says, she says in verse 38, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now that's what I call radical, simple faith. See, whatever dreams or plans Mary had for her life up until now, whatever dreams she might have begun to have about her children, her family, her married life with Joseph, that's all changing in this moment. Whereas Elizabeth just celebrated that God was removing reproach from her life, removing shame from her life by giving her a child, here Mary, who is also getting a child, is willingly embracing a life that will be overshadowed with shame. That's because, and if you're a parent, imagine your teenage daughter or son trying to explain this situation to you. No amount of explaining how an angel from God told her that she would become miraculously pregnant by the Holy Spirit would really adequately do. It couldn't stop the shaming glances from her family and her community or silence the mumbling gossip. Mary's life would be a life of being misunderstood and unjustly shamed. And Mary is willingly, willingly embracing that life, a life full of difficulty. Now, how can she do that? She can do that because the word of God will never fail, for nothing will be impossible for God. Look at verse 37. In the ESV Bible, <clears throat> the angel Gabriel concludes by saying, for nothing will be impossible with God. And that's a true sense of that sentence. But a closer word-for-word -word translation of the original Greek would have Gabriel saying something like, for the word of God will never fail. And if you uh, look at the New Living Translation, it actually has that. That's ironic. Usually NLT is more idea for idea. ESV is word for word. But here we are, a little flip-flop. <clears throat> so, if the word of God will never fail, Mary can trust God at his word. If all that God has promised in his word is coming to pass in this moment, and if God wants Mary to be a central part in his great plan, then Mary can surrender all of her plans and her whole life over to God. If the word of God will never fail, well, what else is there to say? Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. In closing, uh, here's where this hits me. I get to thinking about my own life <clears throat> that it's pretty important. I don't know if you can relate. I get very caught up in my own plans, in my own problems, Sure, I want God's help and I want God's blessings, but do I want God's plan? I mean, do I really want God's plan rather than my plan? Am I willing for God to change everything in order to get me on his plan? If I'm honest, I'm much more likely to respond like Zechariah than I am to respond like Mary. But, oh Lord, give me a heart like Mary and a heart like Elizabeth, two women of faith who were ready for your appearing. 2,000 years ago, God ended a long silence, announcing that he would finally send his long-anticipated son, Jesus, to be king over God's people and to inaugurate an eternal kingdom. Jesus, before his ascension to heaven, promised that he would one day return. In Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, we read, just as, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time 
not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus will come again to gather his people to himself and, as the Jesus Storybook Bible says, to make all the sad things come untrue. Therefore, we can have hope while we wait for his second advent. We can have radical and simple faith like Mary as we await the sure coming of our Savior, Jesus. Nothing is impossible for God. His word will never fail, and therefore we can trust him at his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who speaks exactly what we need to hear. Thank you that you are a God who sends exactly who we need to help us, to heal us, to reconcile us back to yourself. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to speak the gospel and save us from our sins, for we are indeed sinners in need of a savior. Your word never fails, and therefore we eagerly await your second advent with simple faith and an expectant hope. In Jesus' name, amen. to work in town. The king of kings was born in a manger. Now we can sing what the angels say. They said, glory, glory in the highest. Peace on earth, will to all men.
as the choir uh, just wonderfully sang, thank you to you all as they just wonderfully sang, of the glory that God has brought of the peace he brings, as Scott spoke of the hope that comes in the expectant waiting of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are all too easily reminded that we look to the things of this world, that we look to our own strength, that we look to what we can do and accomplish and accumulate for our satisfaction and for our hope when these messages call us to look to our Heavenly Father. So let us take a few moments in silent confession, confessing our hearts before God of how we look to this world for our satisfaction and our hope that he would turn us to him. On page 10 in our bulletin is a corporate prayer of confession. Let us now pray this prayer together with one another. Lord of Advent, we have not kept watch for you. We have occupied ourselves with our own concerns. We have not trusted in your will for us. We have not noticed the needs of the people around us. We have not acknowledged the love that has been shown to us. Forgive us for our lack of watchfulness. Help us to submit to your will. Teach us to love as you have loved us. And help us to work and watch for your coming. Amen. And now hear the Lord's assurance of pardon from Proverbs chapter 16. He says, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Our God has come and our God has drawn us to himself. Our God has made us new through the coming of his son, through his life and his death, through his resurrection from the dead where he now lives forever seated at God's right hand as the ruler and king and Lord and savior of us. We come now before this table. We come before the Lord's table and we are reminded and we celebrate with him And Jesus is spiritually present here with us, ministering to us, reminding us, showing us, drawing us to himself that we are saved and we have been made new now and forevermore. This table also comes with a warning. And this warning is that if you are not yet in Christ, if you are living in sin and intend to continue to live in sin, then our God Jesus looks and he says, do not eat and drink judgment upon yourself. But we encourage you to look and explore and look at your own heart. Look at who Jesus is and what he has done for you. There are prayers in your bulletin this morning. Take a look at those if you are not yet in Christ. But if you are in Christ, we are set free. We are forgiven. Our hope is in him. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here. Thank you. 
was crucified, he broke the bread, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And on that same night, he took the cup, and he said, this is my cup of the new covenant. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Lord, as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we know that our hope is in you and it is in you alone. Lord, for you are our savior. You are the one who forgives us. For our sin, who gives us your righteousness, you are the one who makes us alive now and forevermore. So Lord, as we partake of this table, enliven our hearts more and more in you, more and more each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please, let's stand and respond to our Lord.
us raise our hands and receive the Lord's benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, may his name be praised now and forevermore. Go now in the hope of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.